in. All right. Hello. Hello, everyone. It's lovely to see you and to constantly uh, click admit, 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 as if there were someone we were going to deny admission to. Um, uh, welcome to, yeah, I like just keeping it spring rights. What are we going to call it? Winter wrongs? It's not. Right, I know. <laughs> this is where we are. Um, and as, as I was talking with my, my family about what we we're going to do tonight, uh, we discussed how, how odd it might feel to be focusing on syllables as, um, as, as the world around us proceeds as it has been. So I just, I wanted to pause right here at the top and, and take a moment to note that it's, you know, it's been a difficult time for just about everyone, right? The pandemic, what's been going on in, in DC and around the country, all of it. Um, so I want to thank you all for joining me tonight. And I, I hope my aspiration here is that thinking deeply about syllables for an hour and a half might serve not as just like a relief from the immediate complexities of our lives, but also perhaps a new method of grappling with our relationship to this reality that we're all living in. So, so I'm gonna focus on what you signed up for, which is a workshop on syllabics, but you know, we're all humans, we're all living complicated lives. And I just wanted to acknowledge that upfront. Um, I hope you're all doing well and I see a cat, so. Yay, Joyce has a cat. <laughs> a Zoom call now, we've done it. Um, all right, so I am Dan Rosenberg, and also thank you, Robin, and, th and thanks to you know, all the work you do with Spring Rights and everything. I should have also started there. Um, I'm Dan Rosenberg. Um, I am uh, an associate professor of English at Wells College, which is just a half hour up the lake from Ithaca. Um, uh, a poet and this topic of syllabics actually is near and dear to me. My, my most recent chapbook, uh, which came out from Omnidon, uh, is called Thais Hollow, and it is a book entirely in a strict syllabic form. And I also teach a course on poetic forms at Wells, and so I've been thinking about and working in and sort of ruminating on what syllabics are for a long time. Um, and this is a large group of us, and I'm sure we have like varying degrees of comfort or familiarity with this subject. Um, and so I'm going to not assume any particular baseline knowledge here going forward, but if I lose you at all, please um, give a shout or you can, there's a raise hand feature in, in Zoom, which you are more than welcome to use or um, you can type a thing in the chat. I see lovely greetings and hello from sunny Colorado. Um, that is kind of mean, Jane, to talk about it being sunny. I'm in upstate New York, but that's fine. Um, it's lovely to have you all here. Um, but do, do flag me down if I lose you or if you have something to say, just jump in. We were discussing earlier the sort of parameters of this Zoom call and my attitude toward muting and unmuting is, um, being muted if you're not trying to speak is the is the normal default mode for all of us who are living these weird virtual meeting times but um but i would welcome you to unmute yourself if you are in a quiet room you can just stay unmuted and that's cool that way you can jump in with a question or a comment or a thought and i'd be very happy to to have someone else's voice interrupt mine at various points in here um so um, today the, the plan, the game plan is we're gonna learn a little bit about what syllabic poems even are, why someone might want to write in this form and how we might do so. Um, then we're gonna take a look at some of the poems that, um, that we are going to discuss as models and maybe take some time at the end to try to write our own and talk about them, write early drafts of, of some of them and write them. Um, so if that sounds good, normally I would ask you to introduce yourselves, but this is a, a large enough group that I'm just gonna ask you to take on faith that I'm excited to hear from each of you and glad to see your faces. Um, so the other thing that is important bureaucratically is I have just put in the chat a link to a document. Um, if you click on that, it should just appear in your web browser, whatever you use to wander around the internet and you should see a handout that has um, a, a paragraph up at the top and it's several pages with poems and things in it. 
can I can you can someone give me a thumbs up to say that they were able to click on that and do it? Thumbs down. I don't see a link yet. You don't see the link yet. Um, send chat to everyone in meeting. Let's try it that way. Ah. Did that work? All right. Thumbs up from Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Um, I think I sent that to people in the waiting room who don't exist. So everything is fine. Technology working as planned. <laughs> um, anyone having any trouble finding that or, or seeing it? Uh, not, I see it, but now we don't see you. <laughs> um, Zoom is its own separate app. So you probably are looking at your web browser and you just have to click on Zoom again and I should pop back up. I see, okay. Zoom yeah. again. This is, this is the technology. Um, <laughs> Oh, wait a minute. Uh, well, so my face isn't that important. We can that just... didn't work. No, you can't find us still? Yeah, that's right. You're not there. Oh, nope, nope. I knew I shouldn't have clicked on this. Oh, uh, no, but I'm going to need it because we're going to talk about it. But maybe. Okay. All right, all right. All right, well. I'll figure you... it out. Back, Joyce, not yet. No, I, I'll just listen to you. Okay, that's fine. I'll, I promise not to communicate any important information with my facial expressions. Good. <laughs> um, all right, so we have this document. All right, we're gonna go through um, pretty quickly. We're gonna start off with this overview about like what are syllabic poems at all. Um, and I'm gonna limit my discussion of this to English language um, poetry because other language have a rich syllabic tradition. You probably, all learned at some point in school that haiku are poems with five syllables, seven syllables, and five syllables, right? Um, almost everything that we learn in America about haiku is, is wrong, <laughs> um, but the American understanding of haiku is indeed a, a syllabic form in this similar way. But syllabics are like the secret stepchild of English language poetry. They've been happening um, in subtle ways for many years and they don't get discussed very often. Um, so the modern syllabics as we understand them today were really pioneered in English by the British poets, Robert Bridges and Elizabeth Dariush, his daughter, and also the great American modernist, Marion Moore. Um, Robert Bridges argued in 1901 that John Milton had actually anticipated syllabics much earlier with his wildly irregular prosody um, but that argument is a little bit silly. And it was probably just a way for Bridges to justify his new meter and appeal to precedent that wasn't really there. Um, that said, the fact that anyone found Bridges' argument even a little bit persuasive speaks to how sneaky syllabic are, how tricky they are, how hard they can be to differentiate from free verse and loose accentual syllabic verse. Now, I've just said a bunch of terms and I promised you that I was not going to assume a bunch of information. So we're gonna, we're gonna define some terms very briefly here. Um, so most traditional meter in English would be accentual syllabic meter. That is, it measures both accents, also known as stresses or emphasis, and syllable counts. So the meter that we've all learned from like having read Shakespeare is, is iambic pentameter, right? And that, label broken apart. Pentameter means uh, a meter of five feet and iambic tells you what type of metrical foot we're talking about. So an I am is an unstressed syllable followed by a stress syllable. So two syllables uh, in an I am. And so if you have five of them, what you end up with is a 10 syllable line of alternating stresses, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, 10 syllables, right? Would be iambic pentameter. And we Hear it all the time, poets in English have been working in these forms for centuries, and we can hear that stress pattern, right? Shakespeare, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks. Ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, right? Five ba bums. And even when it's not perfectly regular like that, we can hear an irregularly begun iambic pentameter line resolve into regularity. Something there is that doesn't love a wall. The something that it, something there is gets a little bit messy. It's not that bump, 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 but then we can hear that does not love a wall, but bump, 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 bum, right? And so that type of meter that counts not just the number of syllables, but where the stresses fall within those syllables is accentual syllabic. And that's the sort of default metrical system for English um, formal poetry. 
Um, what we're talking about is not accentual syllabic though, it's just syllabics. And Robert Boom in his 1957 essay, and this is the very first thing on the handout that I gave you, um, gives us a definition for what syllabic verse in English actually is, right? Syllabic poems actually are. Um, and I'll read it and it may not illuminate things, but we'll work through it and really <laughs> we'll, we'll get to an understanding. Um, he defines it as verse which disregards the foot system. Remember an I am is a type of foot, right? So for accentual syllabic meter, you're figuring out the meter by looking at the little units within a line and identifying the pattern of those units, those feet. Syllabics doesn't care about feet. Um, whether foot by quantity, which is how Greek and Latin poetry works, or foot by stress, which is how German and English language poetry works. And instead of being measurable metrically into the small regularly recurring units within the line, it takes the whole line as its metrical unit. Each line, or in the case of a pattern of varying line lengths, each mating line contains the same number of syllables while stress number and stress position are not fixed and while the lines are end paused. Okay. We're gonna break that apart into more digestible chunks so we can understand exactly what it means, right? Um, the first thing that I want you to note, importantly, is that syllabic poems don't try to do away with stress. They're not rejecting stress. You can't do that in English. English is an accentual language. Um, what syllabic poetry does is it says, I don't care where the stresses fall. I'm not trying to pattern it. I'm not trying to organize it. So that means that syllabic poetry sounds like free verse poetry. Right? There isn't that organizing pattern. You haven't, you haven't standardized where the stresses fall in your language. They fall wherever they fall due to natural speech or maybe deeply artificial and awkward speech, however you're organizing your language, but it's not mathematical. It's not, order, it's not organized. Um, so that, that's the first note. The other note about um, Boom's definition that I want to point out is he has this long parenthetical where he talks about the case of a pattern of varying line lengths each mating line. Um, there are two basic types of syllabic poems. There's uniform syllabics where every line has the same number of syllables. And then there's variable syllabics where the line lengths vary in their, in their number of syllables, but they vary according to a pattern. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna go to examples because talking about this abstractly gets hard, right? Yeah. So we're gonna look right down on the next page of our handout is our first example of a uniform syllabic poem and it's Sylvia Plath's metaphors, okay? Um, and are we there on the handout? Can we see it? Yeah. Metaphors, great. Um, I'll actually give you a frame because we're not gonna have a ton of time to talk through these. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of an interpretive lens before we read it. So it's our first example of a uniform syllabic poem. It's a nine line poem nine syllables per line, as it announces in the very first line of the poem, right? I'm a riddle in nine syllables. Um, it's also a series of metaphors for the pregnant speaker. Um, and I want you to sort of note as we, as we listen to this, that there are, there's no like pattern of stresses here. It's not iambic or otherwise. The lines sound as unregulated as free verse. And this is the other thing that's important to note that Baum's definition suggests, but doesn't make entirely clear, is that a line of syllabic poetry is a line of free verse poetry, right? If you take one line from any syllabic poem in isolation and look at it, it will look like free verse, right? Because it doesn't have any internal pattern within it. What makes a poem a syllabic poem is if there is a relationship between the lines Right, so you take a series of free verse lines that are all nine syllables long, boom, you've made a syllabic poem. That makes sense? Yeah. Nods, 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 great, lovely. You're very responsive and I really appreciate it. It is, um, I have a feeling many of you have played this game before where you've talked to a series of dark mm -hmm. angles with names and I really appreciate the effort to not be that. Um, that's <laughs> Um, so, okay, so the line is the unit of measure is what I'm, what I'm saying here. So um, let's read the plath and then I wanna ask you how this form functions in the poem. Like what does it do to the poem to have this weird syllabic pattern organizing it? Metaphors, I'm a riddle in nine syllables, an elephant, a ponderous house, 
a melon strolling on two tendrils. O oh, red fruit, ivory, fine timbers, this loaf's big with its yeasty rising. Money's new minted in this fat purse. I'm a means, a stage, a cow in calf. I've eaten a bag of green apples, boarded the train, there's no getting off. Sounds strange to hear a man read that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it is, mine is not the voice that one would imagine <laughs> this poem happening in, for sure. Yeah. Um, so, would, sorry. Okay. No, you please, you go ahead. I was just going to say, I would hear a lot more of anger if it were female. Yeah, you think? A yeah. melody strolling on two tendrils and, is just funny to me, no matter what. No getting and off. fear. Yeah, and, and disgust, right? <laughs> No getting off, God damn it. I didn't get that abortion. <laughs> um, that is that is fantastic though. You are you are keying in on the sense of a loss of control in this poem, yeah. right? Yes. Even the constant effort to self-define, right? The idea that you're gonna create a poem that's a list of metaphors for one's own pregnant body. Yeah. It suggests that it's not a stable experience, right? It, it's a little bit like this, a little bit like that. I can't quite articulate it right, so yeah. I have to make a whole list. Um, right? So does that, that sort of tone, that feature of this poem get enriched by the syllabic form? Is it in tension with that form? How do we see those two things working together? Well, to me, it sounds like an an, uh, an attempt to to not be emotional, and yet it and yet it delivers gigantic emotion. It's so if I if I can paraphrase you, Joyce, um, yeah. suggesting that this form is a kind of performance of order and stability and control that yeah. that proves to be unpersuasive, right? Like the the power of the poem is that it is this voice is trying to articulate a kind of control and failing, right? And the- and Well, it's the, the exact opposite of, the very fact that it's the opposite of the style is what makes it so, I think, I don't know anything about poetry. <laughs> no, I think you're there, right? There's tremendous tension between the- yeah, 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 that's what I mean, yeah. Between the tone of the poem, right? And the fact that she's put it in a tidy little box, right? Yeah. So it's an imposition, this syllabic form is an imposition of order and control on a subject about which the speaker feels very much out of control. Well, right? feel, I, I, this is the last thing I'll say. So, 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 so what you're saying is that, that a syllabic poem is an orderly thing um, about something that feels, period. Something that feels, well, I would yeah. say, that syllabics are very flexible. I just put the the link to the um, the thing back in the chat because I saw some new people show up, and that's the handout that we're that we're using. Um, syllabics are very flexible. You can do a lot of things with syllabics. I would say how the syllabics are functioning here, in conjunction with things like the lack of enjambment. Right, every line ends with a piece of punctuation here. That contributes to the sense of orderliness of the poem, the sense of control. Mm -hmm. Right, this isn't a poem. That is, that is loose and frantic and slipping its bounds, right? This isn't a poem where the body of the poem feels um, maybe misshapen in a way that might seem more natural to a poem about the anxieties of pregnancy. Yeah. Um, right? Um, it doesn't do that. It's pushing as a kind of resistance against that. And the fact that the poem can retain that sort of angst while being in this tidy little box is one of the achievements and strengths of this poem, but. Um, I'd like but, to say something. I, I find this poem to be a very loose ars poetica in the fact that it says I'm a riddle in nine syllables and then there's nine lines and each line has nine syllables. So I think that's. In nine months. Yes. I think that's a hearkening of what Sylvia Platt, you know, how playful she could be not only with her words, but within form. She's like created her own form here. 
and almost poked fun at herself for doing so. Right. And it's a riddle and it's called metaphors, but it's not a very difficult riddle to unpack, right? We can under, like a quick read of this can get us to the, there's anxieties about pregnancy happening here. Um, but absolutely, and, and Joyce, your point about nine syllables and nine lines, nine being a particularly meaningful number for someone who is thinking about their own pregnancy, mm. absolutely. Like this is a game that she has played with herself and you can imagine that she had a lot of fun um, coming up with this set of rules and then finding a way to build this poem in this little box that she made, right? Um, that's great. And anything else that we wanted to sort of note about this poem before we keep going and look at a very different example? Yeah, please, Mark. Yeah, the, tr the trick of unmuting oneself after you've raised your hand. Where's Mark? Um, it seems to me that the syllabics, which have no meter or, or rhythm, allow within this control of the same length lines uh, more of a force than these same statements or similar statements might have if they were subjected to um, a regular rhythm, a meter, and which I, I think might diminish the impact of this state, these statements. Like if they were, if they were um, more audibly regulated. Yeah, yeah. Meter, yeah, yeah, the looseness of the line itself um, contributes to a sense of naturalness of the speech, right? Um, mm -hmm. And there have been lots of arguments um, in defense of syllabics that make the claim that syllabics allow for a greater range of tone than, than traditional accentual syllabic meter. I'm not particularly persuaded by that argument. I have read formal poems in a wide variety of, of tones, right? Like I think you can, like there are some truths, right? Like um, iambic pentameter tends to feel a little bit more stately, a little bit more refined. Um, in part due to the tradition that we've inherited of iambic pentameter. And, you know, if something sounds like a limerick, if it follows that metrical pattern, um, we tend to think of it as light and playful. Like there are some associations we have with different accentual syllabic, accentual syllabic metrical forms. Um, and we don't have those same associations with syllabics, but that's just a function of familiarity, I think. I think people haven't been paying as much attention to syllabics. Um, and I think, I think the range is available in a variety of, I'm, I'm always hesitant to buy into anyone's argument that says this type of poem lets you do X. Um, or even like, as we were discussing this earlier, the syllabics create this sense of order. It's like, well, no, the syllabics are one feature of the poem among many that work in concert to create the effects of the poem. Right. We, I think the one-to-one -one causal relationship that we sometimes try to, um, um, that we sometimes try to make when we're talking about these things can oversimplify the dynamism of a poem. Their, their parts work in, in sequence or, or in conjunction with each other. Um, so that's cool. So, all right. So we have here a good example of a uniform syllabic poem. And I want to scroll down the handout to the next poem, The Fish by Marion Moore which is our example of a variable syllabic poem. I remember Baum said there are these two types. In Marion Moore's, if we look at it now, first of all, without even reading it, you can look at this and see that there's some sort of pattern at play. <laughs> Just looking at it on the page, you're like, there's a pattern. I see each stanza starts with a really short thing, gets a little bigger. There's things happening with the indentations as well. Um, there's a, there's a pattern at play. You know that this isn't normal free verse. There's something weird happening here. Um, but what's going on in, in The Fish, which is an amazing poem, I think. Um, it has stanzas with lines of, the syllable counts for each line. One, three, nine, six, eight. Um, and that pattern repeats all the way down the poem. But you have to do some things like opening and shutting itself like, Mm -hmm. Opening has to be two syllables instead of three to really hear that, to hear that eight, to get it to match with the other lines in that position in the other stanzas. 
So there's something a little bit tricky happening with more already here. And what a weird arbitrary form. One, three, nine, six, eight. Why? <laughs> Why marry more? And what's like the other thing that's super noticeable without even reading it is you'll notice that unlike Sylvia Platt's very orderly syllabics where each line ends in punctuation is a coherent thought, um, Moore is happy to not just break her clauses and phrases over the line to enjam her lines, but she'll break apart her words to fit her pattern, right? So um, without even reading it, we can see that unlike Plath, Moore's poem is full of tension between its form and its rhetoric in, in that way, right? Like she has sort of mangled the language to, to fit it into this form. And so I wanna read this and ask you, how does that tension serve? You know, I'll read it. I'll offer up some answers to how that tension serves the poem. Then I'll ask you to sort of expand on that and enrich it. All right, um, we'll, we'll do it that way. Now I'm self-conscious that I keep reading all these poems by women in my deep- I'm manner. sorry. <laughs> um, the fish. And it's so good. So Marion Moore, Marion Moore is one of the like great modernist poets and she was um, a mentor and friend to um, um, Elizabeth Bishop who also has a poem called The Fish. And her poem does what we would assume a poem called The Fish would do. It talks about a fish, right? It does <laughs> other things too. Um, in Marion Moore, right at the beginning we're thrown because the very first word, Wade, makes us realize, oh, Oh, the fish is plural, right? Because if it had been a single fish, it would have been wades, right? So, and we're, we're thrown into the poem immediately. The first, the title begins the sentence. It's such a wonderful way to like hurl us headlong into the poem and leave us disoriented from the beginning without breaking any, without doing anything like um, insane with her syntax, right? She's just arranged things on the page in such a way that we are, we are caught up. It's so good. The fish wade through black jade. Of the crow blue mussel shells, one keeps adjusting the ash heaps, opening and shutting itself like an injured fan. The barnacles, which encrust the side of the wave, cannot hide there for the submerged shafts of the sun, split like spun glass, move themselves with spotlight swiftness into the crevices, in and out, illuminating the turquoise sea of bodies. The water drives a wedge of iron through the iron edge of the cliff, whereupon the stars, pink rice grains, ink bespattered jellyfish, crabs like green lilies, and submarine toadstools slide each on the other. All external marks of abuse are present on this defiant edifice. All the physical features of accident, lack of cornice, dynamite grooves, burns, and hatchet strokes, these things stand out on it. The chasm side is dead. Repeated evidence has proved that it can live on what cannot revive its youth. The sea grows old in it. I love Mary Moore. She rules. <laughs> um, so you, you'll notice the sort of madness of that form and how she breaks apart, um, how, how radically enjammed this poem is. She breaks apart words, she breaks apart phrases, where the lines end seems to have no stable relationship to the rhetoric of the poem, right? It's not like I've reached the conclusion of my image, so it's time for a line break. It's just a deeply enjammed, deeply disruptive kind of form, right? Um, the poet Rowan Ricardo Phillips suggests that this form this weird syllabic structure that she has um, warped her poem into makes, and this is his quote, all words and possible meaning compliant to its will, like flotsam that moves where the waves move. That is, this is a poem that is in some sense about an overwhelming natural force divorced from humanity. And it presents itself as such by virtue of this form. Right, this form seems to not care about 
human language, the English language. It is going to move words around where it will. And if that breaks apart words, so be it. It looks like water. It looks like water, right? And, and the indentations give you that flowing sense. They also track the rhyming. I don't know if that, if the rhyming was audible to you as patterned as I was reading it out loud, but if you just look at the, it's couplets, Wade Jade keeps heaps. And then the, the fifth line is unrhymed. Yeah, I actually wanted to ask about that because I, I mean, I realize now that there's no reason why it couldn't rhyme, but we think of rhyme so much as tied to feet and all the usual forms that I was really surprised. Like, wait, is this allowed to rhyme? But yeah, I guess there's no reason why it can't. Um, I don't know, can you say anything about that, the use of rhyme within this unusual syllabic form? Yeah, it, and I mean, the use of rhyme functions the way all sound play functions in free verse poetry, because in English, we are so trained to hear the stresses and to hear rhymes happening, to hear a rhyming pattern based on the number of stresses that fall between the rhymes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and so what that means is that they don't sound like, like a, this doesn't sound like a rhyming poem to us. The rhymes sound as incidental as internal rhyme in a free verse poem, right? It's part of the pleasure of the sound of it, but it doesn't shout to you hey, there's a pattern here. Hey, look at this pattern. I have built myself a straitjacket and then successfully navigated my way across a tightrope with it on, right? Like it is, but that's what she did. Um, and so I think the rhyme, like rhyme can operate much more subtly in this form, just as the, as the syllabic form itself operates more subtly um, because it abandons the thing that we have been trained to attend to when we're looking for rhyming patterns. But here it is. Um, so the indentations are Marion Moore's way of making it look like waves, sure, but also noting where the rhymes are, um, a kind of key or guide to the clever game she's playing, right? Um, but I wanna get back to this idea about, about it being, this form being mimetic of a sort of natural force, right? Because um, of course, that sense of an overwhelming natural force, the idea that this is a poem that is in some sense voiced by, by the sea, um, is itself artificial and highly constructed, right? Which is to say, it seems like a poem celebrating the power of the sea's agency beyond the works of humanity, but it's also a poem that screams at us very loudly, Marion Moore did some crazy things intentionally. She has mangled this language because of her will, right? Like it is... Um, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, Phillips calls this poem a pan to an uninterrupted natural world that has been interrupted at every step along the way, right? Which I think is just a, a lovely way of understanding the beautiful contradictions of this poem, right? Um, so, so other things like, I think that, that tension is part of what's why I wanted to call this poem to your attention in particular, that idea that she has chosen a very intricate form that forces her language into uncomfortable structures um, and forces us to read across her line breaks aggressively. Otherwise we can't make sense of what she's doing. Um, and that's combined, if Sylvia Plath made sure that every line is end stopped, um, Marion Moore has these long, complex sentences that are grammatically coherent sentences. They just have all sorts of buried clauses in them that make them really hard to track. Um, so why? I'm sorry? Why? Why, why does she do that? Yeah. Well, I'm gonna turn that around to the rest of us. What does that do to us as readers? Like, as I was reading this to you, um, as you were reading it along, as you may be looking at it again. Yeah. What's your experience of these lines? Can you keep the whole sentence in your head? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Joyce can. Um, Aaron, maybe not so much. Yeah. I find it challenging, right? This, this long sentence, right? The barnacles which encrust the side of the wave cannot hide there for the submerged shafts of the sun and then we're gonna have this long description of the sun's rays, split like spun glass, move themselves with spotlight swiftness into the crevices, in and out, illuminating the turquoise sea of bodies. Bitch. 
That's um, a sentence that goes across like two and a half stanzas. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's, it's so, kind of Proustian. Yeah, yes, and it's so dense and things just accrue to it, right? It just goes on and it grabs more bits and, and things just multiply and there's this growth to the sentence that happens as she wanders off and like decides she's going to give us this lovely description of shafts of sunlight underwater, right? The sun split like spun glass. That's a lovely way to describe what, what rays of sunlight might look like underwater. Um, but it, it interrupts her sentence constantly. Her sentences are constantly interrupted, which is part of um, my experience of this poem, which is that it is stable and coherent and she's got very clear and this is true of all Marion Moore poems really if you sit down and you take the time and you read them carefully um, they will reveal themselves to you because she is a careful she's a meticulous um, craftsperson of of language but these poems particularly the fish also allow you to just let the language wash over you and just enjoy the sounds and enjoy the images and live in this world that she is building for a little bit. Um, and I wanted to make one comment that when this poem was written, it was obviously written by hand. And mm -hmm. that, that entire art of just doodling would lend itself to more naturally come up with a, you know, sort of unconventional form rather than sitting at a computer, which is very formatted. And so I kind of envision this as being very loosely written. And then it came to her that it could be an unconventional form, which wouldn't happen if you're typing on a computer. Uh, maybe. I don't, the, the early drafts of this were not in syllabic form. The, early, the earliest drafts look like free verse. Um, so there is, there is a strong argument for the, the the fiddling that she endlessly did, maybe leading her to this to this structure. Um, I don't I don't know if you couldn't get there on a computer. Um, I think in many ways the type of obsessive fiddling that we're talking about here is a lot easier in a digital medium because you can just move things around. But also that shortcut robs you of opportunities to discover new things because you don't have to rewrite the whole thing by hand. Right? There's. Uh, it's a it's a mixed blessing. This um, very cool. But what like for our purposes, thinking about about syllabics, I wanted to just have these two really divergent models for what syllabics can do. And so, to contrast that initial thought that like Sylvia Plath is showing us that syllabics can offer this sort of stabilizing structure, more the sentence is stable, but the syllabic form that she's put it in is wildly disruptive of that stability, right? So it's not, there isn't a specific effect that writing in syllabics can achieve. It's how it operates in relationship to the rest of what your poem is doing that, that determines the effect, right? Um, so I wanna, I wanna back up a little bit and say we have these two main flavors, sort of uniform and variable syllabics and they're, and they're different approaches and effects. And we can see how those forms function in the context of these two specific poems. Um, but I want to sort of ask this larger question that um, that maybe Jane alluded to here. Um, other forms can achieve similar effects in various ways. You can you can be um, grasping toward order in another form, right? You can speak about impersonal forces in another form. So why syllabics specifically? What do they what do they give us? Um, and Elizabeth Dari Dariush, I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name. If someone else knows better than me, jump in. <laughs> um, Elizabeth Dariush um, described syllabics as a way of composing according to the natural speech rhythm, as opposed to patterns of stresses, right? And Matthew Francis similarly celebrated syllabic lines for sounding more natural and conversational than traditional iambic lines. But both of those arguments sound like free verse to me, right? That's the argument for free verse. Um, and, and in fact, most critics, when they're thinking about syllabics, locate syllabics in the space between free verse and accentual syllabic formal traditions in English. Um, there's this wonderful book called An Exaltation of Forms, has a chapter by Margaret Holly about syllabics, in which she describes the appeal 
um, by noting that metrical, po metrical poets seeking freedom and free verse poets seeking stricter forms meet in the middle ground of the syllables subtle but countable presence. Subtle but countable seems like an important note for syllabics, subtle but countable presence. Syllabic measure, like the many silent rhythms of nature, is there when you look for it, a governing principle that calls no special attention to itself. That, that last bit was also Margaret Holly. It's a governing principle that calls no special attention to itself. And I think that is one of the gifts of syllabic poetry, right? It doesn't carry with it the baggage and the burden of traditional English language meters that are maybe more visible and more, more audible. So um, let, me, let me actually get us to one more spot and we can see how this works. So Donald Hall, our next poet in our packet, um, is one of several writers who treated syllabics as a kind of stepping stone away from accentual syllabic verse toward free verse. And he said syllabics was a way of holding on to number while avoiding iambic. In other words, he wanted the structure, the math of poetry, um, without obviously participating in that dominant tradition. So we can see if we if we go down to the Long River, the Donald Hall poem. Um, this is a syllabic poem. It's four, four, five, four, four syllables in each stanza. So it looks like um, it looks like a uniform syllabic poem, but it's really variable, but just minor minor variation, that one middle line is just one syllable longer in each stanza. Um, and I think what's interesting about this one is that we can hear in this syllabic poem the echo of an accentual pattern. Um, just about all of these lines have two stresses. If we listen to it as, as I, I, I'll read it out loud, we can hear more or less two stresses per line. It can, it can feel like it's flirting with that more traditional accentual syllabic meter, but it's not. He's organized it around, um, around the syllable count alone. The long river. The musk ox smells in his long head, my boat coming. When I feel him there, intent, heavy, the oars make wings in the white night and deep woods are close on either side where trees darken. I rode past towns in their black sleep to come here. I passed the northern grass and cold mountains. The musk ox moves when the boat stops in hard thickets. Now the wood is dark with old pleasures. Had we not been doing a course on um, syllabus, we might have looked at that and thought, okay, probably free verse, <laughs> or, we, or we might have looked at that and noticed the musk ox smells in his long head. I feel him there, intent, heavy, the oars make wings. So many of these lines have two beats to them, right? So it's it does operate in this sort of middle space where um, Donald Hall is interested in preserving what he calls number, right? The sort of math of poetry while getting a little bit more free. Um, and I don't, I mean, I'm looking at our time and I want us to have some time to sort of do a little bit of writing if we can. Um, so I wanna just maybe pivot from this and ask like, what's the virtue of number? Why not go straight to free verse, Donald? Like. What does this get you? Um, and I think we can hear some of the pattern. There's pleasures in that pattern. And um, Robert Baum locates the virtue of number in, this is his phrase, the psychological pleasure of repetition, right? Repeated number of syllables, which roughly matches a repeated duration of time or breath is pleasurable. Patterns are pleasurable. Even if for most readers, that pattern isn't obviously legible at least legible at first, right? So there's one, one quick answer to why syllabics is because pattern and repetition is fun, right? Um, another answer to that is that the, um, the pleasure isn't for the reader at all, right? Um, the pleasure is for the writer. The, the use of syllabics is what it does to your composition process, not necessarily what it does to a reader 
who is encountering the poem at the end of your composition process. Um, and there has been a consensus that's arisen um, among poets who use syllabics that um, syllabics are useful for the composition process explicitly. Um, Rosellen Brown wrote about her, her book of syllabics, Cora Fry, I chose syllabics as a form partly because that meant I would have to ration my words. Every time I wanted an adjective, I would have to beg for it in my syllabic line. So what syllabics offer is that pleasure, the pleasure of constraint, of having a rule to follow, that number that Hall was after, um, because it forces you to rethink your first thought, right? Roselle and Brown might've been like about to throw an adjective in there and she's like, oh no, that'll make my line too long. I have to get rid of it. And that self-interruption does beautiful things to your composition process, right? It makes you rethink your first thought. It allows you to be surprised by what you write, um, which is one of the great pleasures of writing a poem is surprising yourself. Um, and importantly, it's a subtle form, right? And if we think back to, um, what Margaret Holly said, a governing principle that calls no special attention to itself. The subtlety of syllabics means that it's a set of rules and your reader might not even notice it. Um, it's a form that doesn't come with baggage. If you sit down to write a sonnet, you have to talk back to the sonnet tradition. It will be read in conversation with other sonnets. That is a form that carries tremendous baggage. Right? And that's part of why a lot of contemporary American poets will write sonnets that don't follow any of the rules of the sonnet. Because what, what they get from calling a 15 line poem that doesn't conform to iambic pentameter and doesn't rhyme, um, what they get from calling that a sonnet is that they're putting it in conversation with that tradition. Right? For syllabics, you have the opposite. Right, It allows you to have the pleasures of that constraint um, that subtle pattern, but you don't, but your reader won't approach that constraint with the same sorts of expectations. Um, does that make that make sense? Kind of cool, right? So I don't want to spend all of our time on the on the rest, of, like going through the rest of the packet here, because I I am mindful that we have such limited time. But I want to just like look at the packet quickly because I gave you a handful of others. There's Dylan Thomas. Here, a refusal to mourn the death by fire of a child in London. Um, his syllabics are visual, are, are visible, right? Just looking down at the stanzas, you can see the variation in line length seems to repeat. Even if you didn't stop and count the syllables, you could look at each stanza and say, those look the same, right? Or they look similar. They look similar in their irregularity, right? Um, his enjambment is far less aggressive than Moore's. Um, the lines feel a bit more coherent and unified. Um, we can hear the end stops in Thomas's poem, but um, it's still like the same version of syllabics that Marion Moore's is. Um, Donald Justice's Things on the next uh, page is, uh, is uniform syllabics, right? And it's little riddles. Each stanza investigates a common object in this tight little form. The language is deeply clipped and compressed. Right, if we just look at one of them, hard, but you can polish it, seven syllables a line. Precious, it has eyes, can wound, would dance upon water, sinks, stays put, crushed, becomes a road. Then he puts in parentheses like the answer to his riddle for each stanza, which I, I find endearing that he has this poem called Things, and these are the little um, parenthetical explanations for each. But he gives you these lovely things. I love this last one to Wall, to support this roof, to stand up, to take such weight in the knees, to keep the secret, to envy no cloud. What a lovely way to talk about a wall, right? What a lovely bit of empathy there. Um, and so I think like part of what he's doing here is the syllabics force him to compress what he has to say about each of these subjects in this really um, clipped language, right? He can't, he doesn't have room for extra articles, right? Every, every syllable has to carry weight because he's given himself so few for each of them. Um, operating in a very different register in the next poem, James Tate's success comes to Cow Creek is chatty. 
Um, it's a narrative. It doesn't have that echo of any sort of stress pattern. These short lines don't resolve into two beat lines. They're, they're messy. I sit on the tracks, 100 feet from Earth, 50 from the water. Gerald is inching toward me as grim, slow, and determined as a season because he has no trade and wants none. It's hard to hear any patterns in this, right? It sounds utterly natural, this speech, um, but it's in syllabics, right? It's a, it's a wild thing. James Tate is being much sneakier. We can hear the patterns in a lot of these others. It would be very simple to come across this Tate poem and not notice any math behind what he's done at all, right? But the math changed how he wrote the poem, I guarantee you, right? Um, and then the, the very last one is a, a contemporary poet, Shane McRae, um, who does something really interesting with syllabics, The Tree of Knowledge here by Shane McRae. Um, he's got these gaps in the lines, these sejuri that further muddy the rhythms, right? He's got the hastily assembled angel saw, one thing was like another thing and that, right? We've got 10 syllable lines, give or take. He's not religious about sticking to his, his syllable count. Um, but within some of those lines, he has these gaps, these breaks that create different units of, of meaning and sound that sort of operate in conflict with his syllables. He doesn't have any regular punctuation and those gaps don't stand in for punctuation. It's not like there should be commas there or something. They are breaches in the flow of his rhetoric and breaches in the form as well. Um, and you can see, depended on in that first stanza, he is doing that Marion Moore move, right? He is breaking a word apart to fit into a stanza pattern and to announce the pattern, right? Whenever you see a word broken apart, that's a good clue that someone is counting syllables in a, in a really aggressive and religious way, right? But then later on, he doesn't stick to the pattern, right? Um, unlike Moore, who is, who is very strict about her own patterning. So there's even greater tension in this poem between the form and the rhetoric, because the rhetoric sometimes breaks the form outright. It's a less tidy dance even though his poem looks a lot more tidy than Moore's does, right? Moore's looks wacky and um, McRae's, other than the gaps in the lines, looks much more sort of stable, but his is in fact much wilder. Um, so I'm just, I'm mindful of the fact that we only have a, a half hour left and pitching this as a workshop, I wanted to take some time, having thought about syllabics in this way to actually try to write our own. Um, so, to that end, a couple of little notes about, um, about this. The first note is, do you have to count the syllables perfectly? And I would suggest that most syllabic poets miscount syllables sometimes with no major disruptive effects, right? And maybe that's because syllabic poems sound so close to free verse anyway. Um, we don't hear syllables in English, we hear stresses. And so, um, Miscounting might be akin to a metrical substitution in an iambic line, a subtle way to create emphasis for the discerning reader. Um, Baum argues for that. Um, he says he suggests that like having so metrical substitution is you're writing a line, you're writing a poem in iambic pentameter or something, and suddenly one of those feet isn't an I am, it's a trochee, it's a backwards I am. The rhythm has changed. Right, um, the very beginning of that Robert Frost line that I, I quoted from the beginning, something there is that doesn't love a wall, that's a trochaic substitution in the first foot, something there is that doesn't love a wall, right? So that sort of substitution is something that people who are reading um, accentual syllabic poetry can identify, can hear, can interpret in various ways. Um, and syllabics offers that possibility as well, but he um, Baum suggests that those sort of miscountings in Slavics are far less disruptive um, because um, syllabics can lean on the existence of stresses to counterbalance the deviations in syllable. In other words, if you're writing 10 syllable lines and one of your lines has 11 syllables, but it still has five stresses, even if they're not in a pattern, 
those five stresses are going to ground your reader and it won't sound off at all, um, which allows the poet greater freedom of expression without violating the pattern that you've set up in a, in a jarring way. That's a long and sort of theoretically grounded way of saying like, hey, count your syllables, but don't feel absolutely locked in. If something needs an extra syllable or one less, it's okay. Um, the, the other more sort of significant danger of writing in syllabic poetry is what if I accidentally write in accentual syllabics? That is, what if by total accident, I end up creating a stress pattern, um, which happens. M much English language resolves into alternating stresses. Um, and Donald Justice actually suggested that people who want to write in syllabics choose a number of syllables, choose an odd number of syllables um, per line as a way to avoid the iambic pattern, um, which I think is a, a clever little workaround. But um, those are my two sort of big, big notes for you. And then I want, I think at the very end of my packet here that I gave you, I have this as a, as a writing prompt. Um, so I'm asking us all to take, let's see, we go until eight. So let's maybe take 15 minutes to do some writing and then we'll take the, the tail end to share those of us who are interested in sharing. Um, so the, the, steps that I am encouraging you to take now, um, <laughs> um, the steps I'm urging you to take now would be first decide if you're drawn to variable or uniform syllabics. Do I want a bunch of lines that are all the same, that sort of regularity and control, or am I interested in trying something a little bit more um, wild? Um, and I encourage you to abandon rhyme for this project because that just adds a whole different layer of absolute insane complexity. But if Marion Moore really got you or you, you're looking at the Dylan Thomas and you're sort of excited by what he's done with rhyme, go for it. Um, and then I offer up my like ABC down here, sort of abstractions out of what some of these poets have been doing in their syllabics. Right, and I'm suggesting for our purposes, if you can try to get in the ballpark of 10 lines, you've done pretty well in 15 minutes. But um, really, this isn't about crafting a beautiful syllabic poem. This is trying your hand at it, seeing if this is fun for you, because syllabics are uniquely exciting as a as a kind of constraint, because you get to just make up arbitrary rules for yourself and run with them, and it's and it's tremendous fun to give yourself. The challenge of like, okay, I'm gonna do a poem that has, you know, it's in three line stanzas and it's six, four, nine. Those are the number of syllables in my three lines. And I'm gonna keep doing that and let's see what happens and see it will force you to turn in places that you didn't mean to turn in your poem. Um, does this sound good? Yes, please. Um, I was just wondering when you were saying about like, you know, that it might still end up having five stresses in a line. Isn't that still an accentual form, even if they don't fall into a pattern? Like, how is it not accentual poetry if every line has five stresses? And I don't know. I'm just wondering, like, how wouldn't you have to deliberately avoid that to make it not be accentual po accentual poetry? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Accentual versus accentual, because if it's accentual syllabic, that's pretty easy to avoid. You just need to not have the stresses appear in a pattern, right? But if you're suggesting each line having five stresses is itself an accentual form. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it is. Okay. Right? These things are very close to each other. And that's why, mm -hmm. I mean, that's part of why I think I, I said at the, at the very beginning, right? There's the goofiness of how um, Robert Bridges said that John, um, um, John Milton had been writing in syllabics. Like, no, he wasn't. He was just writing in very irregular iambic pentameter. It was very loose. It had tons of substitutions. But that sounds a lot like maybe he was just counting 10 syllables and hitting and like starting a new line, mm -hmm. right? If the, if the stresses aren't falling in a strict enough pattern, it can feel like syllabic. These are close, right? And I think what would make it not sound like an accentual poem would be if some of the lines don't have five stresses, but they are 10 syllables, right? But then the ones that break from your 10 syllable rule 
do resolve into about five stresses, which is what most of your lines will be flirting with anyway, unless you're consciously avoiding it because English tends to be drawn toward those alternating patterns of stress. So about half of your, half of your syllables are gonna feel stressed often. Um, yeah, but, but the, the answer to your question is yes, right? These things are, are connected and can be indistinguishable from each other. Um, and I hope one of the takeaways from this conversation is that the pleasures of writing in syllabics are in some ways independent of the effect on the reader. And so do it because it helps you write in a new and exciting way. And then if that form becomes a legible part of the poem, so be it. And if you end up revising away from syllabics as you're revising your poem, who cares, right? You've made a cool poem, right? So um, the hope is that this is generative. I don't know if that, if I got away from your question, Ella, but. Uh, no, great. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I, and I like that kind of constraint, like microfiction and that kind of thing where you have to work hard for every word. So yeah, it makes total sense that it's it's more about the process. Yeah, awesome. Um, <laughs> Also, Ella, just to answer your question in the chat that I didn't see, um, um, quantitative meters measure duration. Um, it's, it's a hard thing to even explain in English. Various poets have tried to write in quantitative meter in English, and it's impossible to hear. It's, it's madness. Um, yes, I did try to look that up in the middle, and it, like, it gave the example of the word above, which is a short and then a long, just kind of approximate that idea. So yeah, that makes sense. They're just basing on something else. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't, but in English, it doesn't sound like it's, it's inaudible, really. It sounds like someone has been writing in free verse or some sort of, we hear the stress patterns so much more loudly than we hear the duration of syllable. Um, but yeah. other languages are different. Yeah, and that can be a difference in meaning in other languages, the length of, yeah, anyway. Absolutely. Interesting stuff. <laughs>
Okay, folks, we're just going to take another minute or so. Um, it's lovely to see you all working. Okay, one of the things that I didn't problem solve here is the possibility of sharing <laughs> what we've done. Um, one way would be to just copy and paste it into the chat. Um, that might be a nice thing, or you, or just reading it to us. Such little things, right? Such little, it's hard. Um, as Ella, you noted, uh, oh no wait, Aaron noted, who noted? Yeah, Aaron noted that this is hard, right? Um, Ella fessed up to counting on fingers, which is exactly what I was doing. Um, maybe instead of like starting off by asking asking for a share, would anyone tell me like for those of you who who write poetry in your normal lives, um, but maybe haven't done this approach before, how does it feel compared to your your normal composition process? Besides, way too short. <laughs> You might have to unmute yourself. I started writing in five syllables and found it very restrictive. <laughs> you know, it's easy to count it on one hand, but it was very restrictive. Yeah. Um, absolutely. I, I also did five syllables for some reason. Um, and for, here, as promised, good, here's my six-year-old. Hi, we're still in the meeting. There we go. <laughs> Hi. No, you gotta get out of here, my buddy. Can you get my daughter? Fantastic. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right, Marie Claire is, is offering it up a line at a time here, which is interesting. So the five syllables, I like Rhonda, I agree. I had that same sort of short, and part of the pleasure of that, I don't know if, what, where did you locate the restriction? For me, it was, I don't want to end the line there. Like the line as a unit is unsatisfying if I just chop it off at the fifth syllable. Mm. Where, where did you find that, that difficulty, Rhonda? Like what was the tension there for you? Well, it, I was able to make complete sentences, but the whole thing was rather clipped. Yeah. So it's, it's rather short, I'll read it. Great. So the title is, what's the question? And then the poem is, ask me your question. I'll tell you the end. I'll try to answer, but make it concise so I understand. And once I've answered, forget what I said. Nice. So just, um, that's I think what part of what I really like about how you've done that is that you you indeed had each line be its own coherent sentence you didn't enjam them at all but that lends to a, a real air of authority to it mm -hmm. which dovetails nicely with your like ask me your question and I will answer like there's a, there's a certain um emphatic certainty to the voice of that that marries well with how you use the form right well yeah I don't know how I got started on that. It wasn't something that I planned. <laughs> That's um, I'm, I'm not sure what I did. This is the first time I've done an exercise like this. And uh, it's just very brief what I came up with. It was beyond when I came home, wandering streets, slick with, lane, with rain, memories and tangling hair. So recently your hands had touched. 
kind of seven, and then the last one is nine. Nice. Yeah, it's so it's it's inaudible, right? Like, were, were you guys trying to hear the pattern, and you can't, particularly if the if the writer reads over the line breaks, it's it's really impossible to hear it. It's syllabics are, in some sense, just a visual form in that in that way, right? Um, just hearing the poems, they will sound like free verse poems. But that was lovely, lovely uh, imagery in there. How was your... If you make your lines longer, it allows you to get into the imagery. If your lines are really short, you, you feel that you can't do that. You have to be really concise. Well, I think that, that also depends on if on your sense of the line, right? If you need the line to be a coherent rhetorical unit, then then maybe that'll get tricky. But if you're willing to do something more like what Marion Moore does, where she allows the image to spill over multiple lines, then then the the force of the syllabics becomes a <laughs> of just quiet rephrasing, like, oh, I was gonna put a two-syllable word there, but I'm at the end of my syllable count. I'm not allowed to put that two-syllable word there. I have to rethink it. Did, any, did anyone hit that when you were writing? You're like, and this next word is gonna be two, ah, damn it, I can't. <laughs> Constance is giving me the hard nod of this is the exact experience I had five minutes ago. Um, and the hope for that, and I, I see you, Ruth, we'll get there right one second. The mm -hmm. hope for that is that, um, um, that becomes the opportunity to be like, okay, I can't put that two syllable word there. What else can I do? And then your poem turns for you, right? Mm -hmm. you a new solution to the problem. And that changes where your next line was gonna go. And you get to experience that pleasure of surprise, right? Frost said, you know, no surprise for the, no, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. Um, I think that is, th this form allows you to create that surprise for yourself. Ruth, you wanna, you wanna? Well, um, well, I think I sort of forgot what I was going to do, but I, I was just thinking that um, as someone who writes really short, sort of like to the point things, you know, um, um, when I was teaching, I used to say to my kids, you know, get everything down and then get rid of the word poop. You know, it's kind of like, um, well, like, you know, like the, the kid that, you know, wanted a pony and woke up with a room full of manure and said, I know there's a pony in here somewhere. Um, but uh, it, so I, I found this sort of interesting to be able to, um, I don't know what I created. I mean, I did create something, but still it's, um, I, I found that it, uh, it made me really have to choose words. And then I finally had a word that I wanted. And so I just put it in anyway, <laughs> but I mean, I'll read it to you. It's, a, um, it's like, um, I stand stirring, lasagna noodles, staring at them, writhing like sea serpents, oblivious, thinking of cats, splink, splink, sparklers, songs, poems, and suddenly immortality. Nice. What was the uh, what was the organizing principle? Um, it, it it started with sort of four or five, four or five, um, but it, it's just um, um, I like to cook. This is one of those things, and I f I find that lots of times cooking, uh, you know, I'm like my mind somewhere else. This is a very meditative thing usually for me. So um. nice. That's great, I, and I I like that. You had that impulse. I had that impulse too. And I wonder if others had this as well of like, I want to put, I, I am resisting using just one syllable words all the way down or something. Like I'm drawn to it to a longer word by virtue of like, I don't know, the pleasure of watching it eat up my allotted syllables. Yeah. You know, no, I had to have immortality and it just and so I had to split it with immortality. Oh. <laughs> so if you could see it, you could, but I didn't type it. I wrote it out. So right. So mortality on its own as the four syllable end. Yeah. And I had to do that with serpents too, because the word serpent was just too good to I mean snakes wouldn't have worked. <laughs> oh fun. Yeah. So you found yourself breaking the words apart to sort of match, yeah. match the form. And then that that becomes one of the most noticeable formal features of the poem, right? is so yeah. look at that and see that you have um you have broken these things maybe like uh, lasagna noodles um yeah. <laughs> Claire, do you want do you want to read this out loud or do you want me to read it what would make you happy who said that oh, oh. Let's see. 
you. You're, you're muted, Marie Claire, but are you interested in reading it or, or do you want me to just share it? You're still muted, though. I can't hear you. <laughs> I can read. Yeah, sorry. I can read it, but I've, I've, I made a mistake when I'm reading it. I don't know if it works with what you were talking about. Uh, soft and thin like silk paper, crimson red and translucent, oval, a blood stain on green grass, pollen in the light wind. This is the riddle, like uh, the riddle poem by, uh, so I don't know, I didn't give you the answer. <laughs> nice. um, crimson red and translucent oval. A blood stain on green grass fallen with a light wind. Yeah. A leaf. <laughs> no. no. Close. <laughs> <laughs> It's a poppy like petal. Baseball, a poppy's petal. Ah. <laughs> poppy petal. Interesting. Yeah. The what petal? What was that? I, I, I asked what she had said. I didn't hear it. A poppy. Uh, a poppy petal. A poppy's petal. I see. The, pet, the petal of the poppy flower. That's a poppy. Oh, a poppy. I was close with leaf. You were yeah. close. You were very close. I, I was thinking leaf as well. I was like, well, not quite oval and not quite soft usually when they're falling. So they're yeah, yeah. <laughs> in that register. Yeah, it's lovely. Um, and, and how you read it, how like the pauses there. And I, I'm so intrigued by like translucent is such a nice word and it eats up so much of your syllable count. So I think when you know that someone's writing in this sort of tight form, it changes your understanding of the choices that they've made, right? Um, and there becomes a kind of pleasure to that. Oh, this is lovely. Deanna, Deanna shared one as well. Do you want to read that as well now that we can all see it? Oh, it was so silly. I just, it was really hard for me to do this. So I, <clears throat> I really like it because it was really a challenge. But I just wrote, the cat meows all loud. He is hungry. His fat belly must be deflating. I've been writing, ignoring his crying lies, but now I shall get him food. It's time. That's all I got. <laughs> nice. His fat belly must be deflating. It's a sad description. <laughs> uh, very nice. Um, yeah, it's the sort of thing that like I can imagine because that's very casual and chatty in it and it's in its register. I can imagine if this poem went on, um, it could become a really interesting thing where we would see that form, we would see the relationship to the form evolve as you're going, right? Where like you would find some moments of of frustration that would get animated and then some moments of just like fluidity where you're going right through it the way you are here. Um Thank cool. you. That's really nice. Erin, would you be interested in sharing yours? My poem's not very good. Um, but uh, I was just looking, I have this shelf of games in my little office here, which makes me think about how much I don't really like games. So I started writing. Um, I dread, don't look forward to, honestly, games with my child. Cardboard box split at the seams, sweaty dice, deck of bent cards. Along the way partway though, through. Actually, I do enjoy. These games give me time, close, sweet, peacefully. Waiting my turn, this game would last forever. Nice. The irregularity of that is really like, like that's, that's one that announces itself through the variable line lengths in that way. Um, and it, it, particularly the radically different line lengths has this really fun effect, I think, in the context of, of this poem where it is like both orderly and disorganized. It's like a controlled chaos, which maybe I'm just projecting a little bit when you talk about games with your child, <laughs> that, that is that feels like an appropriate form in which to discuss such things. <laughs> so controlled chaos. Um, yeah, very, very nice, y'all. This is, this is lovely. I'm glad to see what you're all doing. And I hope that this has been 
an interesting way to think about um, maybe a different mode of composition for us all. I'm looking at the time, I see it's just about eight. Um, and I, I'm loving, some of these are direct, uh, direct messages to me that are coming in, um, including Celeste mocking me for not being in sunny Costa Rica, which I deserve. Um, but it's been really lovely to see, oh, there's a hand, Tatiana has a hand up and you learned how to use the hand feature, bless you. So you get to speak right now, Tatiana, what's up? <laughs> I just wondered if the poems that were in the handout, um, I, I don't know if technologically you can do this. Can I, can we have those to keep in some way? Can they be copied? Um, when you clicked mailed? on that, link, if you have that handout with you, you should just be able to, it, it should save be, it? yeah, you should have an option to say save it and it should save right on your, on your computer. It's in, it's a Google form, I think. So you just click download. Yeah. And then you've got it on your computer. Yeah. So I have to do that before this program is over, though. <laughs> um, when we close the Zoom, it won't kick you out of that Google Doc. The Google Doc will still be there, so you'll be able to download it whenever. Um, but and I have to click it. Uh, I have to click Google Doc first. If you. We're, we're going to welcome to tech support with Dan. Uh, yeah, if you if you go to the web browser, um, if you if you're looking at the document, you should have an option on the top that says file, I believe. Let me actually go back up to the top and actually click it and see. I'm not lying to you. Yeah, there should there should just be a download option on the top. Um, I think the download. There's download. You see it? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, this is lovely. Thank you. <laughs> the cat speaking back to you. Um, I'm so glad that you're all here. I see people sort of disappearing. Control plus S works. Thank you, Celeste, to save, to save the doc. Um, I also encourage you, if you liked any of these poems in particular, all of these poets have lots of work that's readily available online and you should buy their books because they're great, particularly, um, Let's see, who's still alive? Shane McRae, obviously, is still alive. Um, everyone else might be gone. So, um, so I'm not so concerned about funding them anymore. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, do check out these poets' work because they're all, like I just picked a handful, an arbitrary handful of delightful poets who work in this form. Um, I'll also just give a special shout out to Robin Schiff, whose book, a Woman of Property uses syllabics as well, but it's the poems are very long and I, I couldn't find an easy way to excerpt them for this, but she's someone who does beautiful work in this form as well. Um, I'm so glad to see you all and thank you. And thanks to Spring Rights again. Um, I am supposed to remind people that this is being uh, recorded, right? So this will be available in the future as will all of the workshops hosted through Spring Rights. Um, and I hope you're all safe and well, and thank you for, for doing this with me. It was a real, a real treat. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Awesome. Thank you so it much. Was, it was you. fun. Lovely. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.